Do you know who I am? I am Ergo the Magnificent, short in stature, tall in power, narrow of purpose and wide of vision, and I do not travel with peasants and beggars. Goodbye. <laughs> Greetings one and all and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. I'm going to be doing a bit of a change of pace video for you today. I'm actually going to be talking about movies. Well, okay, ultimately I'll be talking about the soundtracks from those movies. So I am going to be talking about music as usual, but, well, bear with me here. I uh, see something happened recently that compelled me to do this video. I didn't have it on my agenda until just a couple months ago. And see, what happens was, in the past couple months, uh, two movies that I loved when I was a kid finally got their long-awaited expanded orchestral score releases on CD. Yeah, uh, the, both of the movies in this case, uh, the only soundtracks that had been released officially were the song-based soundtracks. And of course, you know, one of my first loves, as I probably told you in my channel earlier, was uh, orchestral film scores. And so, you know, when I saw the releases, I got them anyway, but I figured, now, I don't want these, I want the soundtracks, you know, the, the, the scores from the movies. So, of course, I had to wait, you know, 30 years to get them, but anyway, better late than never, right? So I decided it would be fun to talk about uh, the movies that I loved as a kid. Uh, it's basically going to be, going to be a, a decade in the life sort of thing. Ideally, it would start with 1980 and end with 1989, but uh, there wasn't really a 1989 movie that I really enjoyed the score from, and there was one from 1979, so it's still going to be a decade, but shifted a year back. So from 1979 to 1988, I'm going to be talking about one movie from each year, that I just totally got into as a kid, just absolutely loved to, pe to pieces, uh, I'm going to be talking about them by way of their scores. I'm only going to include one movie per year. There, there are several years in here that I could be talking about several movies, but just to uh, make the video as concise as possible, I'm going to limit it to one per year. But one of the two releases that uh, spurred me on to do this video, I will be talking about later. It's my 1984 pick. But the other one, I already have a 1985 pick, so I thought I'd talk about it here, uh, introductory sort of thing. The Goonies. Uh, yeah, this, uh, of course, when the movie came out, the song-based uh, soundtrack album came out. Um, headlined with, with uh, Cindy Lauper's The Goonies Are Good Enough, pretty popular single for her. But, uh, yeah, until now, there was only one or two tracks of the score that came out. Uh, the score is by Dave Grusin, and I have one of those on uh, his Cinemagic um, compilation which, now that I have this, is, I think, pretty much going to be redundant. Uh, and this was just happened to be a happy accident. Uh, one of the things that my friend and I went uh, to see on our sightseeing trip of Oregon were some of the movie sites, uh, the filming sites from the movie The Goonies up in Astoria, Oregon. And it just happened to be a happy accident that I actually picked this up on my, on my trip up there up to Portland. I got it at uh, Music Millennium. Just a coincidence, it wasn't by design, but yeah. Finally have my hands on The Goonies movie score. Wonderful score by Dave Grusin. But anyway, as for the year-by-year -year knockdown of uh, my favorite films by way of their scores, uh, 1979 started with uh, one of my favorite Disney movies of all time, a movie called The Black Hole. It was one of their first real forays into serious science fiction, uh, if you don't count their uh, ad adaptations of Jules Verne's like uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and a couple other things like that. At least I think Disney did that movie, I'm not sure. But anyway, this movie actually, uh, well, first of all, one of its stars was uh, Anthony Perkins. And while pretty much everybody else on the planet recognizes Anthony Perkins as uh, Norman Bates from Psycho, for years I saw him as Dr. Alex Durant from The Black Hole. So I didn't make the Psycho connection until my young adulthood. But anyway, uh, another couple of things that were kind of groundbreaking about this movie, uh, aside from its special effects, it had really, really great special effects for its time, 1979. But uh, first of all, this was Disney's first movie that was rated anything beyond G. This was their first PG-rated movie. It had a couple of uh, uh, low-grade swear words in it. Uh, hell and damn, I think, were the, the bad words. I'm not sure. Pretty mild nowadays, but, you know, back then, being Disney, they had to uh, caution their audience as much as possible. But anyway, the other groundbreaking thing about this movie was its score by John Barry, who is famous for his James Bond movie scores. Uh, this was the first digitally recorded movie score, which makes it all the more weird that it took until 2011 for it to come out on CD. I don't know if this is the original one that I bought. Uh, I think it got lost or destroyed or damaged, and I picked this one up later on, uh, hence why it's in such good condition. 
Yes, if this had been one of my childhood records, the sleeve would be shredded by now. But anyway, wonderful, fantastic score by John Barry. And uh, yes, finally in uh, 2011, I think it was, Disney saw fit to uh, put it on CD in a greatly expanded edition. This is like probably twice the length of the original. The original LP was like 30, 35 minutes maybe. And this is, you know, 60 some minutes, I think. The movie itself has, has probably not aged well. Uh, the story is kind of slow-paced, and it's probably a little bit cliched compared to science fiction nowadays, but I absolutely love the movie. I still watch it. I have it on DVD. But a wonderful movie and a fantastic score. Uh, this is one of the few albums that I would actually, when I finally got my hands on it, I put it on my CD player, put headphones on it, and sat and listened to it. Not doing anything else, just listen to it. I had to just totally lose myself in the music. It was such a huge part of my childhood. I just absolutely loved the uh, the movie and the soundtrack. The the uh, digital restoration uh, was they really did it justice. And the liner notes actually, it's kind of a fascinating story as to how they uh, they had to extract the digital recordings and redigitize them for release on compact disc. Because back in that time. Uh, digital recording methods were in their infancy. There was no standardization, so they kind of had to reverse engineer the equipment that they recorded it on and the format of the uh, recordings. So, and all that whole story is captured in the liner notes on the CD package. So it's a very interesting story for those of you who might uh, be curious about the technical aspects of uh, music engineering and so forth. And moving on to 1980, as you could see with the black hole, I was a bit of a sci-fi geek. I had an interest back then in astronomy. So much so that my parents bought me a telescope that I looked through quite a lot as a kid. Although, you know, somewhere along the way I somehow lost interest in astronomy. I, I don't know what happened with that, but I don't know if it was just a, a childhood phase or whatnot. But anyway, being a sci-fi geek, uh, with 1980, my movie of choice that year pretty much had to be The Empire Strikes Back. Or as it is known today, Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, music by John Williams, we all know this. Uh, the Star Wars movies, probably some of the most fantastic scores of any movie, of any genre, anywhere. Uh, just he did a fantastic job with this, and not only was The Empire Strikes Back probably the best story of the Star Wars movies, this is probably the best score of any of the Star Wars movies. This, uh, believe it or not, this was actually the movie that introduced the Imperial March, Darth Vader's theme. Yes, it's maybe hard to believe, but it was never heard in the original Star Wars movie. Go watch it. You'll find out. I'm telling the truth. And also, not to mention the other themes that were introduced. Uh, Yoda's theme, another fantastic uh, signature theme of the Star Wars universe. And uh, Han Solo and the Princess, the uh, the love theme between Han Solo and Princess Leia. Just a fantastic score. This is part of the uh, Ultimate Soundtrack Collection. The one confusing thing with this particular iteration of it is the uh, jacket is copies the original LP art which goes to, which uh, runs down to and includes the um, track listing from the double LP. So this is actually not the actual accurate track listing because it's the two CD expanded edition that is inside the uh, package here. So putting that aside, uh, they, they, they wanted to carry on the uh, nostalgia theme as much as possible, understandably. But uh, yeah, I am very glad to have this and the entire Star Wars saga is a huge part of my life as it was back when I was a kid. Uh, but yeah, fantastic a bunch of movies and John Williams is pretty much the master, what can I say? Now for 1981, I really didn't want to include more than one soundtrack from each composer, but honestly when you're talking the 80s and you're a sci-fi action-adventure geek like I was, your movie-going uh, childhood is pretty much going to be soundtracked by John Williams. So for 1981, it's Raiders of the Lost Ark. And this was honestly the, the first soundtrack that I really, really got into, and the first one that really, really got me into movie music in general. In some ways, this was a more appealing movie to me than the Star Wars movies. I, I'm not sure what it was. Just the, yeah, I guess, as I said, just the action, adven action adventure aspect of it all. And uh, yeah, I think I had the original LP. I don't have it anymore, but this is the uh, expanded remastered edition from the box set of all four Indiana Jones movies that they put out in 2007, I think. Uh, but I actually had one that was put out in, oh, 1995. The, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, a standalone CD, and what's interesting about these is on the original release of the soundtrack, the uh, the Desert Chase, I think is what it was called, was you could tell that there were some pretty jarring edits in the original LP version, and inexplicably they left that version on this CD, but on the earlier release in 1995, 
they had the unedited version uh, that included all the music that you heard in the movie during that scene. Uh, so I, I, it kind of baffles me that when they came around to uh, Concord Records came around to releasing the uh, a further expanded edition, oddly enough, they left the original edit of that track uh, on there. So that's why I had to keep a hold of this version of the Raiders soundtrack, because yeah, the the unedited version is far better, and honestly, the entire soundtrack overall is just. You know, no matter which disc uh, you choose. Again, John Williams, again, is the master of movie music, especially from the 1980s. And now moving on to 1982. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago that I was very much into astronomy when I was a kid. Well, I was also kind of into computers. I, uh, my dad worked with computers uh, for his job, you know, back in, I mean, in the early 80s. So he was kind of in on the ground floor of computers. And so kind of by osmosis, I sort of got into computers at an early age. So in that, in that aspect, I'm kind of surprised I didn't grow up to be like a computer programmer or, or something, you know, something to do with the high-tech uh, industry. But yeah, kind of like, oddly enough, kind of like with astronomy, my interest in, you know, the geeky aspect of computers really kind of trailed off in, uh, you know, as I went through my teen years. But uh, nonetheless, one of my favorite movies, my favorite movie pretty much of 1982 was Tron. It was another Disney movie, had a great deal uh, to do with computers. The whole storyline uh, revolved around computers. And it was the first movie to really heavily employ computer animation. And again, it may not have aged very well uh, visually or possibly in terms of its story. But again, it's one of my favorite movies from when I was a kid. And the score is by Wendy Carlos. And what was interesting about the score was she uh, used a uh, an actual organic orchestra, I guess you'd say, you know, a, a real live orchestra for the real world uh, scenes from the movie. But for the computer world scenes, she, they took, um, I may be wrong, but I believe it was recordings of an actual orchestra, and she processed them through a synthesizer and turned them into a synthetic orchestra, a synthesized orchestra, which gave a really, really interesting uh, aspect to the music. And, and again, kind of like the Black Hole, it took them forever to put this album out on CD, which was pretty much the format that it was made for, since it was a you know, a synth synthetic score. It took until, what, 2001, so not quite as long as The Black Hole, but it took a while. And uh, again, this is an expanded score. And if you happen to be a fan of the rock group Journey, and if you're a Journey completist, you might want to seek out this album because it has two songs by Journey that I don't think were in, on any of their studio albums. So, yes, uh, one of my favorite, favorite movies. Uh, I, I would reenact scenes from Tron endlessly, pretty much. And I had, uh, you know, the the fleece pajamas that I would take a magic marker and draw the uh, computer circuits on, you know, to make it look like a costume. And I had a, a bike helmet that I used for the uh, the Tron helmets. And of course, the Frisbee that we used for their their discs, you know. It was a fun movie. It was a visually interesting movie. And of course, they put out a sequel, Tron Legacy, back in 2009, I think it was, which was pretty good. Um, pretty far removed from the original movie. But uh, yeah, still a good movie. And yeah, as I said, Tron, one of my favorite movies of my childhood. And when 1983 came along, I was still very much in my sci-fi action-adventure mode, and my movie of choice that year was Krull. This was a sci-fi action-adventure sword and sorcery epic. Uh, I never really got much into the sword and sorcery side of science fiction uh, genre movies, if you will. I tried three times, I think, to watch the first Lord of the Rings movie and I've still not been able to get all the way through it without either falling asleep or turning it off. One of these days I hope to uh, eventually accomplish that task, but uh, yeah, no sword and sorcery movie quite hit me or spoke to me like Krull did. Uh, it's a uh, wonderful movie, and uh, one of the curious things about this movie is it was one of the earliest roles of Liam Neeson, who was, of course, became popular as uh, Qui-Gon Jinn in Star Wars The Phantom Menace, and Robbie Coltrane, who, of course, portrayed Hagrid in the Harry Potter movies. So yes, you'll catch both of them in supporting roles uh, in their early years of acting, if you watch this movie. But yes, a fantastic movie. Uh, I love, love it to pieces. I still do. I have it on DVD. I've watched it. I just watched it recently, actually. And uh, the music is by the late James Horner. And it was... This is one of his most underappreciated scores, in my opinion. I've got a couple of James Horner compilations, and you never see excerpts from Krull on any James Horner compilations. It's always Titanic and the Star Trek movies and other stuff, which, which are great. You know, he, he did great on those, but in my opinion, Krull was one of his best scores. And this is actually the original LP release, and it's actually been through a few different releases over the years. 
uh, this is the original LP, as I said. And I had for a while a limited edition single disc CD version of it, uh, which I actually think you saw in my CD collection video at the uh, last year. I showed it very briefly uh, back in, uh, what was it, 1995, I think was when I filmed that part of the video. And then uh, years later, I was able to get a hold of a double disc uh, expanded edition of the soundtrack. And yeah, this is a great, great score. And one of the biggest flaws about the original LP was it didn't have the main title sequence, which in my opinion was one of the best parts of the score. So I was very happy to get the expanded release so I could finally have the main title music as well as so much more of the music that was missing from the original release. But yeah, a wonderful, wonderful movie. You know, contemporary reviews uh, say it's that it's riddled with cliches and you know, a, a, a boring plot and a predictable plot, but hey, I have a huge soft spot for it, like I do with all the movies that I'm talking about today. Uh, I just absolutely love it. What can I say? And then when 1984 came along, there was really only one movie that would satisfy my sci-fi action-adventure fun itch, and that would be Ghostbusters. Honestly, you know, how could you go wrong with, I mean, with the cast, for one thing, fantastic cast. I didn't really get the more adult parts of the humor of the movie, obviously, until later on. I mean, I was barely a teenager when I saw this movie. But honestly, the, the sci-fi aspects of it and the gadgetry and the fantasy part just completely sucked me in right off the bat. And this was one of the um, movies that, when the first album that came out was the song-based soundtrack, which is this thing. I think I had, I never had it on LP, but I had it on cassette. Uh, and for years, I had the original version of the CD soundtrack. I, I had known for years that they had put out an, a remastered and expanded version of the soundtrack with uh, the 10 minute and 57 second edit of Disco Inferno by the Tramps and the 12 inch single remix of Ghostbusters as bonus tracks. And I'd been looking for it uh, off and on for a long time, had pretty much given up on it. I was at Barnes & Noble a couple years back and was walking around and I saw it right there on the shelf. Sometimes when you're not even looking for something is when you're going to find it. So yeah, I'm happy to say I finally have my hands on the expanded, uh, modestly expanded, remastered version. And one of the things about this soundtrack was the title theme, Ray Parker Jr.'s song Ghostbusters. Okay, it saturated radio so much that I can distinctly remember this. A friend of mine and I were sitting in front of the radio, uh, found Ghostbusters on one of the radio stations, and after the song was finished, we started going up the radio dial looking for, you know, another station that would play it. Because, you know, I don't think we had it on cassette at that point. You know, we just, we loved the song. We wanted to hear it again and again and found another station playing it. Uh, and and this happened, I will not kid you, this happened five, possibly even six times that, you know, after the song ended, before we'd gotten to the other end of the radio dial, we'd found another station that was playing the song. And then, you know, we would listen to it until it was over and then continue on down the radio dial. And that, that happened five or six times. That's how much the song got played on radio back in 1984. That's that's just one of the many, many fond memories I have of Ghostbusters. Wonderful, fun movie. And this is the other movie that I mentioned at the beginning of my video. Finally got a uh, expanded orchestral score release. So, uh, yeah, this is the one I, I bought this right alongside uh, the Goonies CD up in at Music Millennium in Portland a few weeks ago. The score is by Elmer Bernstein, and yeah, the song-based soundtrack had two tracks uh, from the score in it, uh, the main title and Dana's theme, I think. But yeah, this uh, includes both of those, obviously, as well as the whole rest of the score. Uh, something I'd been wanting for a long, long time, for you know, 30, 35 years. So yeah, finally got my hands on it. It, it was worth the wait, honestly. But yes, uh, it's fantastic. And uh, the reboot, I was kind of anxious when the reboot came out a couple of years ago. It was. Uh, I had a little bit, little bit of trepidation, but I am, I am all for the uh, uh, introduction of uh, women in strong, heroic, and leadership roles in movies. So I was totally game to see the movie, and I, I loved the original movie so much that I was bound to be a little bit disappointed, and I was. But I think the movie, the remake, has uh, some good merits on its own. So, but honestly, as far as you know, my personal preference, the original is by far the best. And onward we go to 1985, and my favorite subgenre, I guess you'd say, of science fiction is time travel. And I'm not sure what it is, what it intrigues me about it, that's probably just the whole what-if aspect of it. You know, what if we could go back in time and change something about our past? You know, who amongst us hasn't thought about that to some degree? So yeah, it's just probably just the whole what-if uh, 
um, scenario that kind of intrigues me. And I'm not nearly as much a fan of science fiction as I used to be, but for some reason, time travel, that's that little subgenre of it, uh, it, it still fascinates me. I, I don't watch every time travel movie that comes along, but anyway, uh, the time travel movie of choice for 1985 was, you guessed it, Back to the Future. Uh, it's uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, and this, again, is the song-based soundtrack, the original release, because I don't think uh, anybody's ever put out a remastered version of the song-based soundtrack. But it did have a couple of Alan Silvestri's uh, movie cues, or orchestral cues from the movie. It's probably the movie that really got me into Huey Lewis and the News, the, the rock group, because of their contributions to the soundtrack, The Power of Love, their big hit single, as well as uh, Back in Time, their other uh, song on the soundtrack. But, uh, and another thing that, about this movie was we took a trip, my family and I took a trip to Europe in 1986. And by that time I had gotten a hold of the, uh, the videotape, the video cassette. And back then I had a little portable television uh, and it had a cassette, a radio and a cassette deck built into it. So what I did was I hooked the VCR up to that and tape recorded the audio from the entire movie Back to the Future. And that cassette kept me company throughout the entire trip. I was, uh, Regrettably, I was uh, much more of a homebody back then than I am now. I would uh, do anything to go back to Europe and just to, to visit the sites and just experience the culture back then. I was too young to appreciate uh, the whole Europe thing back then. But, you know, goofy, sheltered kid that I was back then, I, I as I said, I played that tape over and over again. I could probably recite the movie's dialogue from front to back by heart still to this day. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that, that's what the movie meant to me, and uh, I, I still love it as much now. I've got the DVD box set of all three movies, uh, love all three of the movies, and I have all three of the scores. And again, this was another movie that, uh, you know, originally was the song-based soundtrack was released, but uh, eventually, years later, uh, they put out the actual score by Alan Silvestri. And again, it was a movie that, you know, screw the song soundtrack, I want the score. You know, for years and years, I was waited to get the score, and then in uh, 2008... Uh, Intrada Records put out uh, the score from the movie. The intriguing thing about this one is it actually has on the second disc, uh, if you're well versed enough with the movie, you know that um, Eric Stoltz was originally cast in the role of Marty McFly and they had filmed several of the scenes and the movie was taking on a, a different tone just because he was a very different actor from uh, Michael J. Fox and the second disc of this score actually includes some early cues that were done uh, for the movie for when uh, Eric Stoltz was the lead, so it had a, a very much more of a different atmosphere. So it's very intriguing to listen to that unreleased uh, hitherto part of the uh, soundtrack. So one, again, one of the favorite movies of my childhood and my entire life, really. Uh, Back to the Future uh, is just fantastic, and it really, probably that, as much as anything else, cemented my lifelong love for time travel stories. Now, as for the movie that ruled my 1986, uh, those of you who know me well enough are probably asking yourselves by now, hmm, all these movies and he hasn't talked about Star Trek yet? What gives? Well, this is where my love of time travel comes in, as I just mentioned. Yes, it took uh, until they made a nice big time travel story for me to really get into Star Trek, really give it a good, honest try. And yes, Star Trek for The Voyage Home was my it movie for 1986. Uh, yes, I had watched a little bit of Star Trek before then, uh, pieces of a couple of episodes on TV, and at one point in uh, my freshman or sophomore year of high school, during a, a dead period of school, the teacher had brought in the uh, TV and VCR, and we watched uh, Star Trek. It was either Star Trek II or Star Trek III in class, because there was just, you know, nothing to do for whatever reason. So yeah, those were really my only exposures to Star Trek until I decided to take a chance on this time travel story, which of course, totally sucked me in. It was a fantastic movie, a lot of funny uh, parts, you know, a lot of comedy and stuff, and, and maybe at the time it was true, but I wasn't aware of it, that comedy was a way to get to me, uh, uh, to get me into science fiction. Uh, but yeah, what can I say? I love Star Trek IV. The thing uh, I wouldn't know until later on is, this is one of the uh, least appreciated scores of the movie, and not that it's not justified. I mean, the score is, it's a very small orchestra, and it was an atypical score for Star Trek. Uh, Leonard Rosenman did the score for the movie, and it was kind of in keeping with the movie. The movie was lighthearted, so they did, went with a smaller or orchestra and did more lighthearted, jaunty uh, themes for the movie. So 
Not a lot of uh, movie, movie music fans liked the score. Uh, I happen to really like it. Uh, one thing that helped, I think, was uh, the j contemporary jazz band, the Yellow Jackets, uh, pr contributed a couple of uh, tracks to the album to uh, link it to the, the 1985, 1986 setting, you know, when the crew travels to 1986 is basically what the movie's about. But yeah, uh, needless to say, my love of Star Trek just uh, spread out like a virus from there. And uh, yeah, I have pretty much all the Star Trek movie scores now uh, and a huge bunch of Star Trek TV. I plan on doing a Star Trek video or two or three. It might be a little mini-series uh, showcasing my Star Trek music collection at some point. I love Star Trek so much. Yeah, Star Trek eventually won out over Star Wars, although I still love Star Wars a lot. But uh, yeah, Star Trek for The Voyage Home. Uh, wonderful, wonderful movie. Not one of the greatest scores, but yeah. It cemented my love of Star Trek and my love of time travel even more. Now, as we move toward the end of the decade here, you'll notice that uh, as I myself am maturing in my teenage years, my taste in movies is maturing, although it still was, uh, at this point, firmly rooted in the sci-fi fantasy adventure type of stuff. Although we're getting into some dystopian sci-fi here with this movie of choice for 1987, Robocop. Uh, the, the whole thing about uh, uh, man meets machine, you know, the uh, half man, half machine type of stuff, uh, was another thing about science fiction that intrigued me, not as much as time travel, but still. I guess it was probably my uh, fascination with computers at the time that uh, that fed into that. But yeah, this was a, an excellent movie. Yes, very bloody, very gory, especially for a, uh, a kid still in his mid-teens at that point. But uh, honestly, I've, I've grown to appreciate the movie even more in my adulthood. Fantastic movie. I've grown to appreciate the satire of the movie. It was uh, you know, kind of thinly disguised, well, maybe not so thinly disguised in the sci-fi trappings of the movie, but uh, yeah, very, very good movie. Uh, Basil Polduris, I think that's how you pronounce the name, sorry, uh, did the score for this movie, and this is a modestly expanded CD release of the score. I actually, this was one of the first movie scores that I actually bought on CD first and uh, did not own on cassette. Uh, but yeah, uh, very good movie. Uh, it's I, I think it's uh, aged pretty well. I mean, you know, the, the technology aspects, of course, have gotten a little bit clunky in uh, in retrospect, but uh, still a very good movie. Uh, Peter Weller and Nancy Allen and uh, Daniel O'Hurley were uh, fantastic in the movie. Go see it if you haven't yet. Uh, the remake was it was okay. I, I kind of liked it. Uh, it was a movie that I kind of think was in some ways crying out for a, a remake, you know, to see, hey, what could we do with the concept now, sort of thing. Which, you know, with, with any tech-based sci-fi movie, kind of, you know, goes with the territory. With with, with Tron, was I, I thought that was a a kind of a, a legitimization of the fact that it was remade. Uh, same thing with Robocop. Very good movie, uh, and one of my favorite scores, and one of my favorite movies from my childhood. And then wrapping up this year-by-year -year Sonic journey was uh, 1988. This was the least sci-fi movie of uh, the bunch, and but it was still pretty firmly rooted in the fantasy genre. It is Big, the Penny Marshall movie starring Tom Hanks. The score is by Howard Shore, a Canadian film score composer. And uh, yeah, this this is another one that uh, they, they actually did not release any soundtrack from this movie until quite a bit later. Uh, 2002 was when this was released in a limited edition. I was able, lucky enough to get my hands on it. And yeah, I just loved the music. The music was a big part of this movie, actually. Uh, with that uh, piano scene, you know, the, the the walking piano in the toy store that uh, Tom Hanks and I can't remember the uh, actor's name uh, that played his boss at the toy company, you know, so that was that was kind of the signature signature scene of the movie. So, in that respect, it's kind of no wonder that uh, the movie spoke to me was that it had that little bit of a musical connection. But yeah, love the movie, still love it to this day, and uh, it's a wonderful movie. It's it's one of those movies that. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that I appreciated it so early on, because I appreciate it a lot more now. Uh, yeah, another wonderful movie from my childhood, uh, young adulthood at this point. So anyway, yes, I hope you enjoyed this little journey through my childhood and young adulthood by way of the movies that I was obsessed with uh, at the time, by way of their soundtracks year by year for a good little 10 year chunk of my life. And uh, so anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Feedback, questions, thoughts, or suggestions, lay them on me in the comment section below. Also check out the description below for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and check out my past videos. And be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. And remember, life's too short to be a music snob.